giornata, è un vero piacere salutare i nostri ospiti, inizieremo con Nuriel Rubini che è professore di scienze economiche all'Università di Hamburg. È autore di uno dei migliori siti eh, di economia al mondo. E poi passerò la parola a e poi a Richard Baldwin, che è professore di economia a Ginevra. Mi chiamo Wolfgang Munchau, scrivo per il Financial Times e ho anche un sito web chiamato Eurointelligence eh, che si occupa dell'Eurozona. Inizieremo con Nuriel. Nuriel, il tuo sito web è attivo dal 2005 e effettivamente avevo dato già uno sguardo a questo sito internet alla fine degli anni 90 e vorrei chiederti come sia nata questa idea, questa idea del web. Well, it almost does. I would say you have just cut, been cut off for some reason. Uh, virtual was the last thing we were able to hear. Uh, do you hear? Do you hear me now? Do you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you now. Okay. Yes. So as I was saying, you know, what the center of the internet allows is to have a dialogue even virtually. So I'm not here present physically, but it's the one way in which technology can help us have a dialogue on economic, political, and other issues. Uh, my website, before it became commercial, started in 97, 98 as a website about the Asian financial crisis. Suddenly, countries have been growing very fast for a long time, were all going belly up, and no one knew why. Academics did not know why, Wall Street did not know why, the IMF did not know why, the credit rating agency did not know why. So there was a huge amount of debate and discussion what's happening. And what I started was something that was a very simple idea at the time when still the internet was at the beginning. I started to pull together links to news, to op-ed, to new research papers that myself, Krugman, and many others were writing. Because there was this huge amount of demand for economic information and for understanding. And what I realized well, and I the development, you. because the site started that way, but then from the Asian crisis started to cover Europe, the United States, other emerging markets, China, and by now we have 40 plus countries and 40 plus topics, is that in some sense we think that information is free on the web, because when you go to Google or any other search engine, you can click and you can find millions or billions of items, but the reality is that information in some sense, economic or other information, is not truly free. And it's not free because if you search for any topic, say economic prospects for Europe, or what's happening to the US economy, or what's going on in Brazil, if you go on the web and you click and search, you might find one billion different items there as a result of your search but you don't know what's good and what's bad. You might find tons of stuff, but probably 99.5% of it is not useful or is not relevant. So the idea is that in order to make information useful, time is money, and therefore, regardless of whether you're a student or a professor or a policymaker or somebody in a financial institution in the private sector, you need some intelligent aggregation of information. And the whole idea of my website, that is this rgemonitor.com, is exactly of trying to aggregate economic, financial, and geopolitical information in a way that is organized and intelligent. And so the basic elements of that information are, of course, news items, uh, op-ed pieces, and other commentary that is written by people like yourself, Wolfgang, on the FT, The Economist, and many other newspapers. 
There are research papers written by academics. There are research papers written by policy institutions or Wall Street firms. There are other pieces of analysis. And increasingly now, there is also the community of the bloggers. Many the size of any economic like online, whether it's what I'm doing or whether it's what you are doing or whether the CPR is doing, is to create two things. The first one is an aggregation of information by topic and subtopic. Try to filter from all the mass of stuff that is on the web, what is interesting, what's more important. There may be maybe 5,000 academic paper written on, say, dollarization in Argentina, but maybe the most important are only five or 10. You cannot read all of them. You cannot even read the abstract of most of them. So you need a trusted source that can filter and find for you what are the most interesting, what are the most important. And most people don't have the expertise to know that. So you need a trusted filter. And what we do at RGE, for example, is to have a staff of people that are all with either PhDs or with masters in economics or in politics that do that kind of a filtering. Second thing I think that is, in addition to this aggregation, you need to create a community, a community of scholar, of experts, and that's what increasingly blogging allows you to do and communities of bloggers. For example, we have recently launched, as part of the RGE, this Latin American Economonitor that takes about 20 among the top researchers, academic, policy, and otherwise, who are experts of Latin American economies, and they all blog together. So what we do is essentially trying to find and create increasingly community of experts, of interest people, of readers. And of course, in the blogs, you can also have the commentators on the blog. So it's important as we go to the next step, and the next step of the web is web on 2.0, meaning interactive web, creating this community of people that have similar interests. And now the technologies allows us, for example, and that's what we'll do in the new version of our site, customization and personalization. So maybe you can have a version of this model with a MySpace for economists, in which one, in which experts and economists can create their own website or mini website that aggregates the topics that they are interested in. So all these new ideas that come more for application for teenagers like Facebook or MySpace, I think that over time are going to actually be adopted for more professional applications that are those that we do as professional economists. So there is a whole space of things can be done ahead. Nuri, let me just ask one question. I mean, one, one of the notable features of your website is your own, your own blog. And you, uh, you are known to be a very, not only pro pro a profligate uh, a blogger, you blog often daily in certain, in certain days, but also a very controversial blogger. Can you tell me, is this part of the, part of the marketing? Is this just your personality, or is this part of, of, of a marketing uh, 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 strategy of RGE Monitor to have you know, highly pointed views on, say, the United States economy? You've been uh, a noted bear on the, on the outlook for economic growth. Uh, or is this something that, that, you, that, that, um, that you would probably have done in any case? Uh, no, it's not marketing. You know, I have those bearish views about the US economy uh, because I believe in them. But I think that one of the interesting points about this is exactly that if you're going to the consensus, say, all the researchers on Wall Street or even in the official sector, the IMF, the OECD, and otherwise, there are some degrees of constraints in terms of how openly can they speak. And one of the fascinating things about the internet and blogging is this democratization of essentially economic debates. Anybody can set up a blog and discuss and present their views. Now, I think that the good thing about it is that you get more perspectives by doing that. You get lateral thinking, you, need, you find contrarian thinking, you find people that don't have necessarily specific biases or financial interests or conflicts of interest. Now, of course, there are thousands of bloggers out there but I think one of the things we do here, of course, my blog is preeminent, but we have also other blogs in our community. We have the blog of Brad Setzer. We have the Economonitor that is the blog of our editors. We have this new Latin American blog where 20 top Latin 
American economists are presenting their view. So our model is actually, over time, is to de-emphasize me, but to create a community of people, a series of experts on a variety of different regions, of variety of issues, of economic and political issues, and create a community where there is a dialogue. So I think that's the sense in the direction we should be taking. We want to have bearish views and also bullish views about the US and other economic issues. I think people get a lot more when there is a discussion, there is a debate, rather than when there is one consensus view on any issue. And that's the direction we'd like to go. OK, Nouriel, thank you very much. We'll get back. But back to you. I'm going to hand over to Steve. And we need to switch sides. All right, I'm uh, involved in the project that Richard Baldwin is going to tell you about in a few minutes, which is um, a new website called Vox. But I thought I would take a little bit different approach in talking here tonight to try to give you a perspective on the things that Nouriel and Richard Baldwin will be talking about and to put them, to allow you to step back a little bit and understand uh, some of the things they're talking about and the technologies that they're talking about. So my talk is going to be rather general. It won't be in Latin, don't worry. Uh, but I did feel that I had to use some Latin just to honor the spirit of the Council of Trent, which met here a long time ago. And I also faced the constraint of using the word voice in the title of my talk. It's a self-imposed constraint. Uh, Tito didn't make me, but I was determined to get Vox in there somewhere. And when you see Richard Baldwin's presentation, you'll understand why I really want to get the word Vox into the title and into the talk everywhere that I can. I'm going to tackle two questions, two broad questions. The first is <coughs> a little bit descriptive. It basically says, what did the internet look like 10 years ago from the point of view of economists and economics? What does it look like now? And what are the changes? And how do they fit into the kinds of things that Nouriel has been talking about and that Richard Baldwin will be talking about after I speak? The second point I'm going to pick up on is, I think, uh, a deeper point. I don't have anything deep to say about it. I'm sorry to disappoint you, but it's at least a deep point. And that is, uh, where and on what basis do you filter information that you receive, either on the web or anywhere else? And I think there are now emerging two slightly different schools of thought or two different approaches to this. And they quite literally are Vox Populi and Vox Dei. For those of you who didn't have the benefit of an education in Latin, I will translate the Latin for you. That's the easy one. That's the one that everyone knows. There's a slightly extended one which doesn't read in quite the same way and takes a slightly different point of view. And I think these two uh, presentations, which I don't know whether Richard and Nouriel can see, um, uh, ca encapsulate the contrast between what you might call the, the voice of the man in the street and the voice of the expert. And I think Nouriel's site is an expert site, and, and Wolfgang's site as well are expert sites par excellence. They really rely on people with a reputation, either from the academic world or the journalistic world, to tell you what to think or to guide you in your thinking, to tell you what to read. And that those are the gods, if I may use that expression. Uh, I think the internet, in some ways, is pushing in a slightly different direction in which the users vote on what they think is important. Now, that I don't think has yet penetrated into sites like RGE Monitor or other sites like that, but you can certainly see it on more popular sites, where what you see on the site is what the people on the site think is important. Now, I'll come back to that at the end of the talk, because I think that's uh, an issue in which the internet in general is moving in a slightly different direction than economists on the web are, have moved. Let me just talk briefly about the internet in 1997. Some of you here may not have been old enough to know what it was like in those old days, uh, but it was a different kind of place then. Uh, if you looked at 
Bill Goff's uh, survey piece that he updated every quarter and sent out by email, you, will find, you would have found a lot of talk about websites of institutions, CEPR, NBR, research institutions, some government departments, a lot of data that had been put on the web for the first time. People were very keen on data in, the good in those days. A little bit of code and programming. But you wouldn't have found anything on blogs, feeds, wikis, any of this stuff that seems to be talked about everywhere. That was completely absent from the web 10 years ago. In the intervening 10 years, things did change a little bit. Blogs, I think, emerged around 19 late sometime in the 1997, 1998. Uh, it's interesting, the, they're essentially a US phenomenon for many years. They were, I think, I don't have data on this, it's not an easy question to quantify, but they were essentially a right-wing phenomenon initially. There were very few people with non-right-wing views who wrote blogs in the early days. Uh, the first, and they were political and not economics. I think Nouriel is probably one of the earliest bloggers in economics, uh, if not the earliest. Uh, but he was a real outlier, I think. He will know better than I, you know, how, many, how much company he had back then. But in the late 1990s, there were very few economics blogs and very few economics bloggers. They were mostly Americans. They were mostly on the right of the political spectrum. Now, that's changed a bit. Uh, there are more left-wing more a greater diversity of blogs. Even Danny Roderick has a blog now. He started one about a month ago. Uh, so the diversity of political views has changed. There are more economists blogging now, quite a lot more. Some of them very distinguished. So Nouriel has company now. Uh, some very distinguished company, Greg Mankiw, Becker and Posner, and, and others. Uh, so that development was very much non-economics to begin with, very much U.S. I think it's now more economics, more diverse politically, and it's changed a little bit. So what do we have now, today? Well, just to give you a little catalog of some of the things that Nouriel mentioned and that Richard Baldwin will probably mention when he talks, uh, I think I'm em slightly embarrassed to sort of talk about this because it sounds like internet hype and marketing jargon, but I can't avoid it. Uh, the web has changed a little bit from a web in which the content was created and written by institutions, and although maybe less centralized than when there wasn't a web, uh, still pretty centralized. It was kind of a top-down web with very little <coughs> content creation by individual users. That's a big change. That's pretty different these days. Hard to measure how big the change is, but it certainly changed with the advent of blogs and wikis and similar things. So that all goes under the term which Nouriel mentioned called Web 2.0. And again, that sounds like a device for raising funds for a startup in Silicon Valley, and it often is. But there's something underneath there uh, in which uh, at a technical level, the websites operate differently. There's more sophisticated interfaces to use them and actually a lot more facilities for writing things on websites by the users of the websites rather than the webmasters. So at a technical level, there's a big change. Uh, where the IT industry goes, the management consultants are not long to follow. So we now have something not only Web 2.0 but Enterprise 2.0. And there's a nice summary of all that by somebody from M um, Harvard Business School in the Sloan Management Review, if you want to look that up uh, last year. And he characterizes Enterprise 2.0 as blogs, wikis, tags, and feeds. And that's probably pretty accurate. And I think, as I'll show in a few minutes, uh, that's kind of where science and economics in particular has been going, although with a bit of a lag. I'll come on to what I mean by each of those terms in a minute. What isn't featured in McAfee's, the, the article I've cited there, um, in his little study is the use of audio and video on the web, which I don't think is penetrated business very much, but ironically has, has become much bigger in the personal sphere, and I suspect 
ironically, has actually penetrated science a little bit more than it has the corporate world. But anyway, that's the web today, web 2.0, enterprise 2.0, whatever you want to call it. Uh, I don't want to go into too much detail on this, but um, the elements are pretty well known. Blogs, we all know. We read them. You've seen a couple of examples on the screen. Wikis, you may be a little bit less familiar with, but of course, if you've looked up Wikipedia, you've seen one. Wikipedia, not surprisingly, is a wiki. Most people just look it up to look things up, but if you register and click the edit page, you can actually write on it. Not many people do, and not many people even bother to look to write, but it's the essence of a wiki that any user can create and edit content and alter content there. So if you want to go home tonight and create your own Wikipedia article, you can do it. You just register as a user and write away, or you can change somebody else's article. That's the essence of a wiki. Um, they have made some progress in the corporate world and a little bit of progress in the scientific world, and I'll talk about that in a minute. Feeds are web feeds, RSS feeds. I guess you've used them. I won't explain too much about that. Um, tags I do want to talk a little bit about because they relate to the Vox Populi, Vox Dei theme that I'll come back to. Uh, tags are a fancy name for keywords. If you've used the library catalog when you were a student, you know what a keyword is. It's nothing special. But there is something slightly different about the use of tags on the web. Because they're on the web and because other users can see the tags that you create, you can share tags. And tags are a way of classifying content. And when you classify content, you can vote on it. So tags are a way of allowing the user to vote on the importance of the content on a website. And they are used in that way more and more often. Now that's something, as I said, that runs in a somewhat different direction to the, what you might call the expert sites that Nouriel runs and Wolfgang runs. And I'll come back to that in a minute. There's a very nice article on tagging by David Weinberger that you can download from the web uh, for free, uh, and I've given the reference there. But I think tags are something that most people don't know much about on the web, but are, for some sites, becoming very important. Let me get a little bit closer to the subject that's of interest to people here, but not right on economics just at the moment. Surprisingly, the physical sciences have moved a little bit more quickly in this area than the social sciences. That's a little bit surprising. Now, that's not to say that there are thousands of scientists writing blogs on this or that topic. Blogs are not very popular, even among science, scientists, and I'll come back to why I think that is in a minute. Wikis have made a bit of an impression in science, though, even in biology. They have be become fairly popular in experimental and lab sciences, where people want to document laboratory procedures and protocols in biology. And there's a very famous wiki called openwetware.org, the first of them all, uh, which is a very lively one based at MIT. Uh, wikis are, we, we've tried them, and I'll come back to that in a minute. They're a little bit harder to get running in, in economics, but I'll come back to that. I would urge you, if you're interested in this topic, to pay some attention to what Nature magazine does in Web 2.0. They are by far the most advanced um, uh, site and company in terms of making use of web technologies out in any science anywhere in the world. They're far ahead of anyone else. They do a greater range of things and they're more effective with them than anybody else. Uh, they're, of course, Nature is a very well-known magazine, but they're surprisingly far ahead. They have a website called Conatia. Now, you may not have used that, but that's a social bookmarking website for scientists who tag references to in scientific journals and share their tags. So it's a vast self-cataloging archive of scientific references. Nature have podcasts as well. Now, many people have podcasts. You know all, all about them. What not many people realize is that Nature podcasts, which are about 20 or 30 minutes long every week and feature an interview with the article of a, author of an article in Nature magazine, get 75,000 downloads every week. They're very well done, very professional, and they have a huge audience in the science community, and more, more broadly, it seems. Uh, 75,000 isn't much by iPod standards, maybe, but when you think that this is basically physics and biology of the kind of Watson-Crick caliber that's being talked about, 
this is a large audience. 70, if, if the economists could get 75,000 downloads, I'm sure they'd be delighted. There are some differences, however, between business use of Web 2.0 and science uses. And I think this is the area where it is interesting to think a little bit about it. There's a very interesting article by Declan Butler in Nature in 2005 in which he talks about the use of new web technologies in the, in the physical sciences. And what he points out there is that there are some real cultural differences between pure scientists and how they communicate and between people outside the scientific world. And I think uh, what he draws attention to is that somehow people who communicate outside of peer-reviewed journals and outside of seminars are viewed in some sense as frivolous people by real scientists, real scientists in quotes. Now, I don't think that's quite such a, it's not quite the same, I think, in, in economics or the social sciences, but he, he does draw attention to this very real fear, even in among, especially among younger researchers, that people who engage in more open kind of communication through the web are somehow not serious people and they're not to be taken seriously. And I think that may explain a little bit why Science 2.0, as you, if you want to call it that, and perhaps even Economics 2.0 is evolving in a little bit different way. Now let me come to the close of my talk here, or to the close of this part of the talk, and think a little bit about whether there's an Economics 2.0 to go along with Web 2.0, Enterprise 2.0, Science 2.0, etc. I think the answer is probably, if you looked at the various elements, wikis, blogs, feeds, and tags that I talked about earlier, is that we're not there yet. Uh, Nouriel's site is a um, pretty good example, uh, but there's nothing, we haven't, I don't think economists have really embraced all those technologies fully yet. Let me just take you through a quick uh, tour of each of them and explain where I think economists are at in each area and, and uh, analyze why uh, briefly. Uh, wikis are the, in some ways the easiest one. Um, we've launched a few of them at CEPR among researchers. Uh, not very successful. Uh, and I think it comes back to the cultural, um, the culture among economists. Um, either economists don't like to talk to each other, but this conference is a kind of standing rebuke to that notion. Uh, it's just not possible to explain that through that. But I think the, the answer is that um, these collaborative technologies at that level only really work on very data intensive fields, like the lab fields in biology. And the, we've had more success with our wikis in more data intensive areas than in other areas. Theoreticians just don't go in for this kind of thing. So I, I don't see much movement on wikis in Economics 2.0. Blogs are different, of course, but blogs are different things. They're, they're not all the same thing. There are clearly individual blogs. We, we all know about them. Uh, now, it's interesting. They are, there are m many of them in the United States now. They're relatively uncommon in Europe among economists, among academic economists. Um, I would have, be happy to be corrected by anyone in the audience, but I'm, it's very difficult to think of a one man, one person, one woman, whatever, one something blog by a university, uni academic university economist in Europe. They're really not very common. And that's surprising given how common they are now in the US where there, my guess would be 250, 300 of them floating around. Not everyone, not every blogger is famous, but there are a lot of them. Why that is, I don't know. It's just culture or something. Group blogs are a little bit different. They, in, ironically, I think have been a little bit more successful than the individual blogs. The best examples, I think, are Becker and Posner, which is a very good blog. Gary Becker, who will be speaking later, and Richard Posner. That's a very serious blog and a very interesting one. Those guys post two or three times a week, argue with each other. It's, a, it's an excellent blog. Uh, marginal Revolution is another very good one, and there the formula seems to be two or three people who have introduced enough diversity into the blog to keep it lively, and there's always something being posted. So you've got individual blogs, group blogs, 
And then you've got another category, which I would call uh, platforms. I, I don't think I've got quite the right term for this, but platforms, portals. But of course, La Voce is the premier example of that in Europe, by far, the earliest, the biggest, the best, I would say. Um, um, I'm not flattering you just to get my expenses paid. Uh, I think anyone, anyone would uh, agree with that. Telos has followed in France, not quite as big, not as active, but still very good and very influential, especially in the campaign. Richard Baldwin will, in a minute or two, be, in one minute, be telling you about our new venture at a European level, which is in a similar spirit. Um, I'll just finish on this end bit of my topic, and then I have one more slide on feeds and tags. Uh, feeds are not, very use, not much used and not very popular in economics. I don't know why. Um, it's very surprising. Um, for example, the NBR site doesn't have them. Very few sites use them. We only introduced <coughs> them a month or two ago. I don't know why they haven't taken off. My view is that audio and video is the next big thing, the thing which isn't happening and which should. I think tags will become important and social bookmarking among economists. I don't quite see how yet, but I think it will. So that's a prediction. Uh, one more slide. Uh, last slide, and then I will be terminated. Uh, uh, I'll come back to the Vox Dei, Vox Populi argument. There's a bit of small print here. My apologies for it. It's a little bit small. I think what you'll see with Nouriel's site, and ma many like it, Euro Intelligence as well, Wolfgang's site, I would call them the Vox Dei sites. This is the voice of the experts, the priesthood, the, the established experts telling, guiding you in selecting your material. Now, as someone from CPR, and we, that's pretty much the way CPR works, I'm from that world too, so I don't want to claim to be anybody different or better. What I would point out is a slightly different trend in the web world, which you might term as vox populi, in which what you see on a site depends on what the readers of the site, the visitors to the site, vote as the most interesting. And there are many sites that operate on precisely that principle, that what trickle bubbles up to the top of the site is what gets clicked on most or what gets voted on most. Good examples of that are more from the tech IT world than the economics world. But if you think about the evolution of Web 2.0, Enterprise 2.0, the way things are going, you might predict or you might conjecture that that kind of voting and on content might become more important in the economics world. And the issue is who will win out, the gods or the people? And I'll leave it at that. Steve, thank you very much. I pass over straight to Richard. OK, can you hear me? Yes, we can. OK. Scusatemi che non posso essere con voi questa sera. Proviamo con questa video in che in inglese, per favore. So, that's my Italian. I hope you enjoyed that. In my remarks, I'm going to talk about three things. Trends in the profession that have drawn researchers away from policy analysis. Vox's role in helping to improve the situation. And at the end, I'll give you a little glimpse of Vox with Ian's help. We'll, we'll leave, leave, leave Vox off until the, the third part, please. <clears throat> Let me quickly talk about the trends. First of all, as we all know, there's a big shift towards counting journal articles only in terms of evaluation of universities, promotions, and professional standing. It's huge, especially among the young people. And part of this means that you, people are not willing to write conference volume uh, chapters, and even Brookings papers or economic policy papers have been devalued. Now, this has promoted a shift away from policy analysis. At the very high side, policy implications in journal articles is viewed as unprofessional, putting a, say, a, a discussion of what your research means for policy is just not professional anymore. And it certainly doesn't help publication chances, so people are leaving them out. Are we okay there? Okay. The NBR's policy with discussion papers or working papers is a classic example. You're not allowed to put policy recommendations into NBR's working papers. They won't publish it if they do. 
because it's viewed as unprofessional in real research. A little bit like Stephen was saying. Now you can still do things like economic policy in Brookings or get paid to do big studies, but these take lots of time and, and they're quite rare and actually limited to quite a narrow fraction of the, of the uh, profession. There have always been newspapers as an outlet for policy thinking, but this is really quite a high cost to most economists, and it has an uncertain reward because you're not really sure you're going to get it in to the best um, newspapers. And in particular, the best English language outlet, VFT, has reduced the number of columns that they're publishing. So it's even more of an act uh, gamble than before. You have to write the thing before they will evaluate it. And although you'll eventually get it in some newspaper, it's not sure you'll get it in the FT, which is the one that has the broad audience. If we go down to the low side, I think the blogs have debased the discourse. Not Muriel's, of course, and uh, not Euro Intelligence, but, which is not a blog at all. But the best of the blogs are like the chit chat we used to have around the coffee table, where people exchange hints about interesting articles they've read, actually, a little bit of gossip. But at worst, and a lot of them are that way, it's charlatanism aimed at influencing the economically illiterate. You can see that on the right, you can see it on the left, but the blogs themselves, including very good blogs like David uh, Brad DeLong's, are essentially aiming at an audience that's even below the Financial Times newspaper column. Moreover, the good blogs like Nuriel's or Mancus or DeLong's, they take an incredible amount of time and it requires a special set of talent that most economists don't have. And this has pushed good researchers even farther from wanting to contribute to the policy debate. Now, I think this lowering of the policy discussion by the blogs and the raising of, of, of just moving the, the policy analysis out of the scientific journals has opened up a niche for a vehicle that's lower cost in terms of time for good researchers and at a higher level than newspaper columns. This would be a way for researchers to talk to economists in the policy world, public sector, private sector, and the media. For example, one should be able to mention present discounted value when explaining the pension reforms, which is not something you can do in your average newspaper column. But by the time you end up explaining what you really mean by present discounted value, and try to narrow it down to 800 words, it's something that most economists can't do. Hopefully, Box will open up a, an area where on the supply side, uh, good economists can explain the policy implications of their research. Let me just give a couple of examples. Tony Venables and Paul Collier recently wrote a column in the Financial Times arguing that Europe should make an extra effort for trade preferences for developing countries in particular Africa. And the core of their argument is about agglomeration economies, clusters. And in the FT, they had a hard time explaining that in 800 words, so it didn't come through very clearly. But there are many economists in the policy world who would like to hear what Tony and Paul have to say at a level that is significantly less than a journal article or a discussion paper, but uses terms like agglomeration economies, clusters, things like that. Moreover, I think research, uh, especially with the growing importance of empirical research, uh, has something to say to the policy, perhaps even more than before. We have such good data on so many things, social things, social welfare policies, and the policy world's not hearing about these because they're being published at a level which is beyond all but the very highest level of the policy-making world. Now, I hope Vox is going to open up a space to draw more researchers into explaining the lessons of their knowledge and their research in a setting which has lower entry barriers than a blog or newspaper columns, and hopefully has a broad audience, broader than most newspapers. Let me now move on to Vox. <clears throat> I'm going to briefly talk about the logic of Vox and the consortium, and my hopes for how it's going to change the nature of policy discourse in Europe. I'm very optimistic, and I think it will have an impact on the policy world, somewhat like economic policy did in 1980, which was uh, opening up, again, a gap between the highly scientific 
and the newspaper articles. Vox will have three key elements. There'll be columns from what we call foundation contributors, a fixed list of about 25 leading scholars whose names you've all heard, and they've agreed to contribute a good number of columns during the first year and hopefully afterwards. You'll see the list of names is quite impressive. Maybe we could put up Vox now if that's possible. It's up, he said. Okay, perfect. Okay, as you can see, it's a lot of impressive names, the, the usual suspects. Uh, we were somewhat dismayed at how many people in the first half of the alphabet, but, you know, Aguillon, Alessini, Bertola, Marchard, Bouary, you can see all the names. Those people have bought into this uh, project and have agreed to give us uh, a set of columns uh, on a repeated basis. Now, these columns will be 500 to 1,500 words. And they're written for professional economists, not necessarily people with PhDs. As we all know, many, many of the economists working in the policymaking world in France, Germany, Italy, they have a first degree in economics or a degree in public policy. So we're not talking professors of economics to professors of economics, but we're not afraid of using words like present discounted value, economies of scale, multiple equilibria, et cetera. And the columns will include things like tables, figures, and importantly, references to articles, to real research that supports the key findings of the recommendation or supports the key analysis so that the people in the policy world, the policy makers and their staff going down to three or four levels will, if they're particularly interested, be able to look at the research themselves. Now, the phrase is research-based policy analysis and commentary. I'd like to stress research-based. This isn't just famous guys talking about what they think is important. It's famous guys doing research, extracting the messages for policy coming from the research. Now, of course, uh, these founding contributors, you all know them, they will uh, certainly uh, throw in some opinion and uh, commentary uh, that's not based on research, but that will keep things lively. The second, uh, no, we'll also allow to post comments, hopefully. Uh, will encourage some debate and part of ideas to create a community around uh, the, the site where people are discussing, hopefully at a high level. We don't, or have, we don't know yet. The second bit is columns contributed on an ad hoc basis by researchers. So it's not just these 25 people who will be posting it, but many other people. And we already have uh, a number of columns from people who aren't in the uh, list there. So I think eventually it will become useful. The basic philosophy of this is that people who, who will want to go there because the leading economists are writing about policy there. And since everybody goes there, the leading economists will find that a convenient way of expressing themselves on policy in the media. Now, Vox is part of a consortium. Vox was very much inspired by La Voce and Tito Bueri was also very important in getting CPR to move into this. But we now have a consortium with uh, La Voce, Telos, and the Spanish site, uh, which is called uh, uh, Open Society in Spanish. And we're working on a Dutch site, hopefully I'll have a German site, and et cetera. So the idea is each of these sites is run separately, but we share content. And in particular, anything that's on Vox can be taken by these national language sites, translated into it, and put it on. And they will translate some of the local stuff into English to give to us. So although they, there'll be independent editorial policies, if, for example, Olivier Blanchard has something brilliant to say about European unemployment, by putting it on Vox and in the consortium, it will be translated into the five major languages and thereby penetrate much further into the policy-making community than it would if it was just in the FT. Because once you get beyond the top level or the second level, Many people aren't very comfortable reading English. They'd much rather read in their local language. Now, these other, the, the, the non-Vox sites, like Telos and, and Voce, they have their own community, and very much they're focusing on, uh, say, it's Illa Voce on Italian issues or Telos on French issues. But they do occasionally do things that have a broader remit, say, on the constitutional treaty or well, global, what the European Union used to do about global warming. And then Vox will help give a, a bigger... Uh, new to that by putting it in English as well. Now, the 
third element on here is, which is in the far right-hand corner, a uh, column in blue, is CPR relevant research. And I'd like to uh, point out one thing in particular. CPR has la launched, ha is launching a new series called Policy Insight. <clears throat> the first one is by Andy Rose up there. Now these are longer than columns, potentially much longer than columns, and uh, potentially more involved in terms of the economics and the empirics, but they're much, much more accessible than journals. Importantly, they're written by the researchers themselves. So for example, the first one I asked Andy Rose, who has an idea about how the international architecture is evolving. He believes that inflation targeting and central bank independence together is creating a new world. Now, Andy has written that up in a way that's more accessible in a discussion paper, and I think that will be popular. That's the first feature for CPR. We also have featured discussion papers with a little uh, extended abstract to explain what's going on, and then the standard fare. If things go well, and I'm a very hopeful person, uh, we may add many more items, uh, some of the things that, that Stephen was talking about as the community develops, perhaps things to help with teaching, perhaps a Wikipedia for theory, a Wikipedia on database information, econometrics, could be a form. For Richard, can I just ask you to, sorry to interrupt, just can, can you yeah. just wind up just a minute or so and then we yeah. go into a general oh. discussion. Okay, so I'm basically done. I thought what best is that I just hand it over to Stephen to show the features with the tags and the 2.0 features, uh, I can't see what's on the board, so why don't you just take over, Stephen, and show those, the 2.0 features. So, um, right. I, think, I think we probably, we probably do. If, if, yeah. Would you mind if we switch seats yeah, again? Yeah. And um, I would, before, before we do, I don't want to go into a, a big full, full spiel on, on what you've mentioned. You've mentioned our, our far more modest website your intelligence. I was just briefly trying to trying to give you um, show you what we've done, and our starting point has been the eurozone, um, and our realization when it was founded that it didn't have any newspapers, and people were always saying that mm, this is a real problem. There is very little debate. Uh, I mean, there is you know the newspapers write about the, the eurozone. And there are discussions, obviously, among academic economists and conferences of such as our, uh, such as you know, many of us participate in. But there is sort of no forum for both sort of debate, news, analysis, and we've tried to we've tried to uh, uh, produce this. And one of the things we've done, I've, as, a, as a journalist, I've been I've taken an interest in newspaper, in European newspapers, and even though most newspapers cover European news, it is when you actually do a selection. And this is what what again what Nouriel is saying. It is not just some, you know, the best of or some sort of some kind of automated compilation, but it is the kind of judgments that you make when you look at different newspapers, pick up the various, uh, the various stories with a, with, a, with, a, with, a, with a certain relevance. We've had Italy in today and um, stories about Germany, German unemployment, the G8 preparation, uh, the debate about the European Constitutional Treaty, various economic, um, various economic discussions. But one thing we realized that by the uh, once you compile these things, and we do this every morning, sort of a new reality comes in, and uh, a reality that you probably will not find in any, in any, in any, any of the newspapers. And what we've discovered uh, relatively quickly, a fairly, a fairly large number of people interested in, in this thing, sort of a new community build-up that wasn't there before, a community of people with a professional interest in it, and that included econom economists, but it also included policy makers, investors, a fairly wide variety. And I have to underline what Stephen was saying about, about the Europeans. When we started this website, we didn't have a, a feed, an RSS feed. And immediately, there was a week after we launched, there was a, co a former colleague of Nouriel's, in fact, who actually alerted us to and said, no self-respecting website doesn't have an RSS feed. So we spent a whole night basically programming one. And, uh, and then it was absolutely right. We, you know, this is something that we, that, that, that we needed, but it was, we found it was mainly American readers who were interested in RSS and many of the modern, modern fields where the Europeans often didn't know, um, didn't know, uh, what, it, uh, didn't know what, what it was. So there were, um, uh, we, we also find that um, uh, another interesting thing uh, about this website is that we get, a no, even though this is mainly about Europe, Europe and the Eurozone, if you could say this is very much an inward, very much a regional kind of thing, most, uh, not most, but a very large number of our readers, as far as we can tell from our analyses, 
come from, from Asia and from the United States. So that, 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 has, that has surprised us, uh, but it may, may, may also be telling us something about how web communities exist, <coughs> how they come about, that they come, come, come out from different, from different from zones, from, from, um, from regions that you don't, don't expect. We have a lot of reasons from Brazil and from the, apparently the central bank from Malaysia for some reason. Okay, I don't want, I want to stop here and start and getting sort of into a discussion. Um, and um, one point which was interesting from Nuriel, I mean, you started off, as you, as you explained in the, in the 90s, as a website collecting lots of information of interest to your, your peer group. And at one stage, you became commercial. And explain a little bit to us, A, how do you actually make it commercial? Because where I come from originally from a newspaper point of view, we've struggled with this whole idea for a very long time. How do you turn something that we've been, you know, we've had a business model uh, which, which worked well for, 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 you know, for, for, for 100 years. Putting it on the internet became, you know, that became a big, big problem. Making money on the internet is still something that, that a lot of the uh, content providers have great difficulties in. Now, CPR, you may have a different uh, objective function than maximizing profit with a website. I like to talk to you about it. What's the commercial idea behind it? But no, explain to us. How did you make it commercial, and is it, is it really a commercial venture in the long run? Is it, is it a really money-making thing, or is it something that just generates an okay amount of revenue? This happened until uh, 2005 was a free site, and at that time, you know, I was working on it myself daily, and I had a couple of students at NYU working with me, but, you know, by 2002, 2003, we had covered daily something like 100 different topics. And to do it of the quality you needed, you needed more people. So while ideally I always wanted to maintain this thing as a free site, I think that the constraint that many sites face is the one that if you want to do a professional job, you cannot only rely on volunteers. Of course, I was fascinated by what Stephen Neal was saying about this trade-off between Vox uh, Populi and Vox uh, Day. I could not hear Richard Baldwin's presentation, so I'm not sure what he said because of the sound. But uh, we have this trade-off, and I think the trade-off is a fair one. And you could think of creating a community of people, and each one of them contributes, and therefore uh, it remains as a free enterprise as opposed to a commercial one. But I think there are many, many constraints to essentially a model in which it's only a free enterprise and a free community of people. Because what we found out was, first of all, that it's commercially successful. We have now hundreds of paying clients among the top private financial institutions in the world, top uh, banks, top asset managers, top hedge funds. On top of it, we also have some of the major international, governmental, and national uh, institutions, central banks, finance ministries, IMF, World Bank, IFC, and so on. And we also have, among our clients, dozens of academic and other research institutions. Now, of course, no individual student or faculty member will be able and willing to pay, but in the current model, every university library subscribes to dozens of different information services, say Factiva, Lexis, and Nexis, and we provide also site licenses for the entire university. Every student, every faculty, and every administrator within, say, places like Harvard or Columbia has access to our site, and the university library buys it for them. So this is the model that is commercially successful. And I think it's successful for the following reason. At the beginning, people told us you're just aggregating, apart from your own research, free information. Why would anybody want to pay for things that are links to things that are freely available on the web? And the reason is the following one. Time is money, and information is not free. If you have to go and find the gem on the web, you can waste hours finding the gem on the web. And if you are a portfolio manager for a very large global macro hedge fund, and you're paid millions of dollars a year to do your job, the last thing you want to do is to waste three, four hours of your time a day finding the relevant information. So in that sense, filtering of that information that looks like free is a major value added, and people are willing to pay money 
for somebody who can intelligently organize it. In that sense, I think that you need experts to at least organize that information. A model is based only on a voluntary aggregation of people may not work. That's our view. We can embed and we're embedding in what we do elements of web 2.0. We are already, for example, having a blog of 20 leading Latin American bloggers. We already have RSS feeds. We're doing lots of the things like videos and podcasts. Uh, we can do all those things, and they're going to be part of creating a broader community. But you need also professionals. And right now we have 20 to 25 people working for us full time. Therefore, you have to pay them. Therefore, you need to think about commercial alternatives. The free ones, in my view, in the long run, are not going to work. And intelligent commercial ones have a way of being first successful and to be open to a wide variety of people in academia, in the government sector, and in the private sector. Well, thank you very much. I think I pass this over to Stephen now. Right. Um, okay. I think CPR is has a different objective function. We're a nonprofit, so our objective function is to do interesting things without going broke. Uh, so we we so far we've managed that, just like so far Nuriel has um, managed to keep profitable. Um, I think I I'm not sure I agree with Nuriel that. Voluntary um, groups of, you know, free open source kind of means of production can't work in the long run. CPR's worked in the long run. It's, well, the long run is 25 years. Um, La Voce works. Uh, it depends on what the long run is. I, I think that these models will coexist. Uh, now, it's, I think it's also true that uh, CPR and, and, and to some extent, La Voce and, and I guess Vox are, in some sense, there's some cross subsidization going on there between teaching economics and writing about economics, which isn't so easy for Nuriel because he's he's he works at a different pace. So I don't think that cross subsidization uh, works in Nuriel's case. He's in a he's just in a different market, but I think in other markets which are not as commercially oriented and not as time sensitive. Um, I think cross-subsidizing teaching and, and writing about policy and doing research it does work and, and can continue to work. So I don't think these models will crowd each other out. Richard, a question for you. In your, in your presentation, you mentioned an example of an author who had written, or two authors who had written an op-ed in the Financial Times, but then weren't able to express the, the technical details of what they wanted to say to the, the satisfaction that they are able to do on your side. Um, I would, pro I would agree with that um, in general, the ability in to say things in 1,500 words and uh, knowingly that you are allowed to use a, a degree of jargon that probably is not possible in, in, in newspapers, including uh, in the Financial Times too. To which extent do you believe that what you're doing will ultimately pose serious difficulties for the traditional op-ed sections of the newspapers? Because what I, the way I look at what you're doing is, you know, this, is this looks to me like very serious competition. <laughs> We can't hear you. Are you speaking? I think we've lost your voice. Just give, give us a second. We'll try to fix something. Hold on. We still haven't got you. But no, no voice. Soon. Richard? Yeah. Yes. Excellent. Can you hear me now? Okay. So should I continue? Please. Did okay. you, did you, you, presumably you heard my question. Yes, I did. So the, the idea, I think, is that this is uh, providing more input for journalists to write, but I do think it is a serious competition for the standard columns by researchers in the Financial Times. And here I'd like to point out the example of Larry Summers' great idea about global warming, he first put it on the website of Financial Times because he, he was a member and he maybe didn't know where else to do it, but in a longer and more technical way, which was subsequently put down to be 800 words. So when Stephen and I were talking about this, the way we sort of think about it is that if um, an elite journalist reads one of these things and masters the 
underlying uh, research that would make an excellent economic focus. So it's never going to be written as well as something like an economic focus or some of the columns in the, you know, like your column in the Financial Times. And so I think in some ways it's providing grist for that mill as well for the journalists. So I think it will help journalists uh, like yourself or, uh, you know, or, you know, so all of them, Samuel Britton, uh, Martin Wolf, all of those people, uh, write more about economics because it will be bringing, especially the research, more out into the open. They sort of uh, bring it up to another level. But ultimately, we're not in competition with the Financial Times newspaper column. I think we're trying to create a new community of researchers talking to policymakers, which is at a is, is too specialized for even specialized newspapers like the FT. That's it. Thank you very much. I have a question for all of you. Um, following on from Stephen's point about Web 2.1, one of the observations I've made with audio and video is uh, that uh, I very much agree that this is where it's going. But at the moment, we are at a stage where many professionals who are in this, who are in this, um, who are asked, for example, in, in newspapers, you get the journalist being dragged in front of a television screen. A television camera and having to basically say what, he's, what he would normally write and you find that the quality of the writing vastly exceeds the quality of the, of the, of the or visual presentation. Now obviously this is a matter of training that eventually they, they'll be able to do that but my, um, my own experience is that, that there is a limit to, I mean tech, technology gives you the, the ability to read out everything to do this but there are, you know, the, the written word still has as many, you know, it, it, is, it is often faster to read something than to listen to a very long conference uh, or to a very long uh, panel discussions. You would probably not want to have on, on video in, in total length. You need to edit it so there are to, to, to add value to these things to make web to work is probably a very, you know, there is a very lengthy, lengthy, uh, lengthy experience. So my question to all of you is, um, in, and, and, and Nouriel mentioned it in his initial presentation, you know, we are all moving towards sort of a MySpace kind of, kind of environment. What concretely do you have in mind and what, are, are you going to do anything about this? Because we surely, we have decided to, to hold off on, on this for, for a while yet. Nouriel, why don't I start with you on this? What we do, for example, at uh, RG Monitor is a combination of mostly written material uh, and links also to video and audio, and we create our own also video and audio. For example, myself and my collaborator, we do regular webcasts that you can then see in video. Whenever we have a conference call with our clients, we have an audio, and now the clients have asked us actually for a written transcript of it. It's a bit of a trade-off because we find that the people that are the most busy ones, say if you're in a hedge fund or an investment bank, they don't have really time to waste to listen to something for half an hour or an hour. They might have three or four minutes. So if there is a written transcript of a conference call that they missed, they can skim it in literally two minutes and see the most important things. Uh, other people sometimes listen in the background to stuff and they can work while listening to see my face or somebody else's. So depending on the audience, their value of time is different and therefore different ways of transmitting information, research, analysis have different types of audiences that are more or less receptive to it. The kind of clients we have are extremely busy. So the feedback we get is anything that is shorter, summarizing, bullet points to the point is more useful for them the things that are very, very extensive. How about Vox? What, 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 what Web 2? I mean, at the moment, this is Web, web, web 1.0, clearly. Nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with that. I'm a big fan of it. But uh, what's, what's Web 2.0 there? We have tags. Stephen's going to talk about audio. We have tags. In other words, the users tag the article. And then there's a tag cloud. I don't know if you can push on it. And also, we rank the columns. That's the, the, the second thing. The middle column will then have these cloud tags. And the, the larger the number of tags, the bigger is the thing. So it's sort of a way of people sorting through a large number of columns. And it, they're user-generated. It's users who are doing it. 
And then the idea is that th this will be read by professional economists, so it will be tagged by a professional economist. The second part is the, the middle uh, tab, which ranks the articles by clicks. This is fairly standard these days, where the most popular articles will stay on the top. The, the other tab is just the most recent. Stephen has been trying to push audio uh, pods, so I'll let him speak about that. Audio. Okay. I haven't quite understood the tag business. Really. Okay, I'll, I'll come back to that in a minute. Um, without trying to keep everybody past dinner time here. Uh, got it, right. Um, now, this actually, yes, we, you can see it well enough. Uh, the way this site works, and, and others as well, uh, the authors and indeed the users can tag articles with keywords of their own choosing. Uh, this is, well, we haven't quite launched the site yet, so we don't have very many articles or very many keywords, so this is not actually representative of what, you know, a site that was bigger and had been running for a while would look like. But basically, the bigger the typeface, the more articles are tagged with that. So size of type equals equals popularity in some sense. Uh, and if you click on um, a title, there you are, or that on a tag, you get all the articles with that tag. Uh, I realize I'm giving away some competitive secrets to some ferocious competitors here, and doubtless this will be on both of their sites uh, before we wake up tomorrow morning. Uh, but that's the nature of internet business, uh, and if they hadn't stolen this from us, they would have stolen it from somebody else pretty soon anyway. Uh, yeah, so we, we don't mind. <laughs> well, uh, we stole the whole idea from them. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> on this it's all stealing it's at some level. Well, on this cheerful note, I'd like to conclude. Uh, well, I would like to thank the panelists, Steve Gio, Nuri Rubini, Richard Baldwin, and the audience for, the, for their patience, and uh, I'll, I'll suggest we pass on to dinner, as you suggested. Thank you very much. Thanks.